Hey everyone, Leslie Rice here, creator of The Signal, and I am so, so glad that you are listening to this message. It's taken months of hard work to find the best cast we could ever hope for, find the best stories we could, and come up with a format that's unique, interesting, and entirely us. Normally, I'd use this time to tell you everything that's going on behind the scenes and let you know what you can do to help, but frankly, I'm too excited to show you what we've come up with, so all of that can wait till after the show. Final words before you get started, if you want to bring something into the world, don't look at the hurdles. Keep your eyes on the goal and always, always push forward. After all, what's the worst that could happen? Yes! Oh shit, this fucking thing! And that should do it. Testing? Testing? (laughs) Anyone uh, home? My name is Dr. Tegan, starting up tests on receiver mark one. Readings look good so far. Making some fine adjustments. Is there anyone here? Oh, hi. I thought I heard someone in here. I'm looking for Dr. Tegan? Same here, but so far not much luck. Who's asking? Um, Dr. Miller. Dr. Amy Miller? Dr. Tegan contacted me. He said he could use my expertise? Oh, I'm sorry. I just got a bit engrossed. I'm Dr. Tegan. Please, come in, come in. You'll have to excuse my sense of humor and the state of the place. (laughs) That's all right, Dr. Tegan. I get the same way when I'm involved in a project. This place is huge, though. I was beginning to worry that I'd have to leave a trail of breadcrumbs. Welcome to Aerotech. You'd swear our business was building hallways rather than communications gear. And please, call me Miles. Well, if you're Miles, then I guess that makes me Amy. I've got to confess, though, you're not quite what I was expecting. Oh, well, I'll have to try and take that as a compliment. To be honest, I'm a little surprised myself. For someone with your credentials, you're, well... Younger than you expected, right? Hey, you said it, not me. That's all right. I get that a lot. Youngest in my graduating class, and I figured I'd hit the ground running. Speaking of which, let's get right to the major question here. What does a doctor of acoustics need with a quantum mechanics wunderkind? Exactly. Well, what I'm about to tell you is going to sound kind of nuts, but I'm onto something huge that ranges way outside of my experience. Color me intrigued. Allow me to present you with... this. It kind of looks like a radio. What? No, that's just the housing. I needed something big enough to pack in all the gear it needs, and... Look, I'd better start at the beginning, right? That would probably be a good idea. Okay, so you know what Aerotech specializes in, right? You do a lot of government contracts. Radios for the Army, satellite networks... Right, and as you'd expect, that means working with a lot of sensitive equipment. I'm following. A lot of this gear is extremely sensitive. It's kept in vacuum-sealed chambers that are even designed to compensate for the sound the Earth itself makes as it moves through space. All this because even the regular kind of silence in an empty room is enough to damage it. Well, about a month ago, I started to notice that even in that chamber, we were picking up a reading. Okay, so are we talking about radio waves or what? If so, that doesn't really explain why you need me. Radio? No, no. All right, since you're wondering where you fit in, go ahead and give me a basic definition of string theory. String theory? Indulge me. Well, matter is made up of progressively smaller and smaller pieces, right? Molecules giving way to atoms, even smaller to subatomic particles. String theory says that underneath all of this, if you could get to the most minute of all possible building blocks there would be infinitesimal, one-dimensional objects. Strings. And? And what? What do those strings do, though? Well, they vibrate. And depending on that vibration, you get everything. 
time, space, matter, light, all that we call reality. Okay, here's another question for you, one from my field. What is sound? I suppose it's when something disturbs the air. Your ear picks it up, and your brain translates it to a noise. Right, but to put it even simpler, sound is... Vibration? Exactly. Look, that equipment I mentioned, there is no way in hell it could be picking up any conceivable source of vibration. But still... Wait, you can't be suggesting that your equipment is somehow picking up... What? The sound of the universe itself? That actually is what I thought, at least at first. Then... Things got weird. Then things got weird? Oh yeah, because when I started sorting through the data, and I mean really looking at it, I started to notice patterns. Too uniform to just be anomalies, it was like a language. Great, so not only can you hear the universe, but it's actually talking to you. (sighs) I know it sounds crazy, but please, just listen. Not the universe itself, but a signal. I think someone has figured out a way to use the universe itself as a kind of broadcasting relay. Okay. Let's just ignore how far beyond the scope of modern science that idea is for a second. What's your proof? Actually, that's what I've been working on. The boombox. Like I said, that's just the housing. I've spent weeks figuring out how to pack it with every piece of equipment needed to cancel out ambient sound so it can pick up and translate the signal. I've actually listened to a few transmissions so far, and... What is that? Well, looks like you're getting an opportunity to listen for yourself. Trust me, you are not going to believe this. Something tells me you're right. Shh, just listen. This is the signal. Point of origin. Unknown. Destination? Unclear. It carries with it fragments of other places, other times, stories from unfathomable pits of darkness, and worlds of unquenchable, all-consuming light. These tales of realities both unimaginably distant and terrifyingly close are woven into, around, and through The Signal. Hello, and welcome to both our returning listeners, and our very, very special new guests. Here on The Signal, you'll encounter a new type of horror broadcast, one incorporating elements of both fiction and fact, and one in which you, the audience, may find yourselves participating. This time, we'll be exploring two tales, one which audiences may already be familiar with, and one that will be heard aloud for the first time here. We'll also be bringing you our very first local broadcast concerning a certain strange creature that has plagued the black forests of Germany for centuries. A word of warning before we begin. Our stories are not for the faint of heart, and those with no wish to become part of a greater story themselves should proceed no further. For the rest of you, let's get started with our first story. One of the great joys of being human is reaching out, connecting, either through art, the internet, a broadcast, or even through a simple written letter. But when that communication comes from an unexpected source, that joy should be tempered with caution. For writing is a way of conveying thoughts from one mind directly into another. And as the narrator of our first story discovers, the contents of some minds should never see the light of day. From author Andrew Harmon, it's time to learn what happens when one unfortunate soul has cause to say, I've been getting strange letters from the St. Louis prison. Maybe I allowed myself to be disarmed by the fact that he came at three in the afternoon. 
He knocked very softly for a man of his stature, hulking as he was at six foot four with wide shoulders and big, hairy knuckles. When I asked how I could help him, he reached into his coat pocket, withdrew an envelope, and held it out to me. Who wears a coat in August? I took the envelope and looked it over. Its face was stamped over several times with information for the St. Louis Correctional Facility. A letter from prison. Great. I didn't know anyone in prison. Then I noticed a post-it note paper clipped to the back of the envelope. It read simply, Please allow the courier to be present to witness the reading of this letter. I looked up at the man towering over me on the porch. Though he was large, he didn't appear threatening. If anything, his calm smile made me think he might be rather friendly. I asked if he had any clue about the contents of the letter or why his presence was necessary for the reading, but the tall man shrugged and gestured towards the foyer. I nodded and invited him in. In the kitchen, we both sat across from one another at the table. I offered him some coffee, but he silently declined. Glancing up at him one last time, I peeled the flap back and pulled out a ten-page letter, scrawled in hasty handwriting on lined yellow paper. The letter began. You don't know me. You will likely never meet me. I am on death row at the St. Louis Correctional Facility. I was locked up for the murder of my wife and two children. Lionel was three, Macy was just six months old. I loved them dearly, but I did kill them. I will admit that first and foremost. I hate myself for it, and I rot in my cell, tortured by the images of their blood dripping off my knuckles. Let me tell you my story. I looked back up at the tall man with disgust obvious on my face. His calm, soft grin didn't waver as he stared back at me. I got up to get a glass of water, then returned to the letter. The author of the letter, whose name I found out was Fitz Willard, had been incarcerated two weeks ago, and had began work on his letter as soon as he had access to stationery. He never explained how he got my address or why he chose me to share his story with, but the story was brutal. Fitz Willard claimed to have been cursed. My first thought was that he suffered from schizophrenia, but he explained that he had been tested for it with no results. He insisted that a demonic spirit was attached to him. The evil spirit taunted him, tortured his every waking moment. It whispered evil deeds in his ear as he lay in bed at night. It appeared in his reflection as he walked past the mirror. The demon was constantly suggesting cruelties and filling Fitz's brain with insecurities and phobias and sinister ideas. Fitz's day-to-day -day life became riddled by a running commentary on the weakness of humans, the frailty of flesh, and the freedom of bloodletting. Work meetings became haunted by the demon's screeching. The spirit hissed terrible things about every face Fitz passed on the street. The worst still, though, was the demon's thoughts on Fitz's family. He called Fitz's wife a whore, called the children ungrateful bastards. The demon told Fitz that his family didn't appreciate him, that his wife was cheating on him, that his children couldn't stand to be around him, that Fitz could never provide enough for them, that their house was a sty, that their clothes were rags, that everything Fitz had worked towards his whole life was a mediocre joke at best. For ten pages, Fitz Willard recounted the madness that crept into his psyche, the nightmares that woke him dozens of times a night. The demon made light bulbs flicker as Fitz walked under them. He made the bathtub run red like blood. Flies gathered on the mirrors, and the demon's suggestions became more and more furious. They became demands, threats even, until one day Fitz caved in, caved in the skulls of his two infant children with his bare fists before strangling his wife of eight years so hard that he fractured the vertebra on her neck before she finally asphyxiated. That's how he ended the first letter. The tall man stood and nodded to me in silence. Then I let him out the front door. Needless to say, I was shaken. Why would someone decide to share such a terrible story with me? Day two. The tall man stood on my porch again at three in the afternoon, and when I answered, he handed me the second letter. As off-put as I was by the first letter, I found that as I sat watching television that night, I couldn't shake the story from my head. I took the second letter and led its deliverer to the kitchen table once again. I wanted more. 
What word does justice to the nature of the second letter? Dark, twisted, desperate. The yellow paper was rife with drawings of forlorn figures huddled in corners and tiny bodies splayed out in pools of pencil gray. Smudges of graphite made all the little doodles appear in shadows. The second page of the letter was just one big drawing. A woman's face twisted up in suffering, her mouth hanging open and her throat packed full of maggots. Spiders wrapped up in her hair. Tears whipping down from her eyes, her hands grasped her own face. Jag nails dug into her cheeks. The second letter gave me a name to the demon. Grimdeed. Grimdeed the Tormentor. I glance up often from the letter to the man sitting across the table from me. Did he know the terrible tale I was being told? Is that why it was so important that he was present when I read it? His gentle smile never faltered, never faded, as he looked idly around my kitchen. Fitz elaborated on his descent into madness, about the tearful call he made to 911 as he stood over the lifeless bodies of his family. He talked about the trial and how, even in the courtroom, Grimdeed sat behind him at the defendant's table and spoke curses about everyone present. Grimdy demanded that Fitz try for the bailiff's gun at the conclusion of the trial, and Fitz did. This led to a brief beating. Grimdy said that Fitz could stand at the door of his cell, screaming profanity and threatening the guards. This led to a longer beating. Grimdy told Fitz to spit at the judge the next day at trial, and as defeated as Fitz's poor conscience was by the demon's constant influence, he did. The letter ended with another drawing. This time, the whole courtroom strewn with slaughtered lawyers and the judge hung above his stand. All of it was in the smeared gray of pencil lead with grimy fingerprints pressed onto yellow paper. On the third day, I was sitting on the bottom stair just inside the door, waiting for three o'clock. Right on time, the courier arrived, and without a word between us, I let him walk through the door. He set the third letter on the kitchen table and sat down. His smile was brighter today, wider than usual. I could tell by his demeanor that this must be the final letter. I peeled the envelope open and sat with a steaming coffee at my elbow. In his third letter, Fitz talked about his days in prison, how even in his incarceration, Grimdy the Tormentor haunted him. He described how slow the death penalty process took, how he may die of old age in his prison cell long before an execution date was set. His penmanship became a barely legible scribble. His writing was frantic. He was a rat trapped in a cage, being prodded constantly by the cruel musings of Grim Deed, the Tormentor. Fitz's sanity had long passed. He doodled himself smearing something on the wall of the cell with two hands, I assume feces. Fitz said he was thinking about ripping his ears off in hopes that he would deafen himself and escape Grim Deed's whispers. The yellow pages had stains on them from Fitz's tears. He apologized for that. Then, on the last page, a spark of hope. As if he had stopped and gathered himself, his handwriting once again became clean and clear. The last lines read, Grimdeed has grown bored with me. Being locked up like this, I can't do much evil worthy of him. He told me how to end my curse. Well, no. The curse never ends exactly. This is why I'm writing to you to pass the curse along to its next victim. But, since I have a sliver of humanity left in me, I'll at least let you know how it's done. You make someone else pick up Grimdeed's curse the same way I did, by inviting him into your home three times. My heart froze. I didn't dare to breathe as I looked up from Fitz's taunting signature at the end of the letter to find the tall man staring into my eyes. His eyes were an endless black. That cruel grin was wider than ever. What do you want for you? Grimdy demanded. Indeed, dear listeners, one should never invite a stranger into one's home. But what is home? Simply a building of brick and mortar is home indeed where the heart is. Well, listeners, we may just find out, because one very lucky participant has seen fit to invite us in, working as an au pair in Germany, 
She is, perhaps without her knowledge, surrounded by tales and legends both dark and disturbing. And, as we have received her invitation, it's only fair that we should enlighten her. Emma Yoakum, this is your local broadcast. With all the myriad horrors that the universe has to offer, war is among the worst. A man-made monster that has no care for what or who it consumes, it ravages towns, cities, entire countries, and still isn't satisfied. But what happens when a man with an appetite for violence finds that war simply isn't enough for his own prodigious bloodlust? Such was the case with Thomas Johann Baptiste Schweitzer, a recent deserter from Napoleon's army after its ruinous battle at Moscow. Joined by a group of Russian deserters, he and his companions traveled west as Schweitzer slowly made his way towards his home in Alsace, but the road was hard and the supplies terribly short. As legend has it, they made it as far as the village of Whitlick, Germany, not far outside of Morbach, before their need grew great enough for them to turn to desperate measures. Coming across a farmhouse, Schweitzer and his companions decide to take what they want, but facing resistance from the farmer and his sons, things quickly turn ugly. The argument escalates until the soldiers, some say at Schweitzer's command, brutally slaughter the family and begin refilling their depleted stores. But the ordeal isn't over yet, as the farmer's wife emerges from her hiding place, singling out Schweitzer for his role in the death of her family. She curses him, likening him to a rabid wolf. She screams to whatever god or devil might be listening, praying that he should live his entire life the way he has acted today, as a beast, something lower than a man. Schweitzer's response is as immediate as it is perfunctory. He crushes her skull with a rock. Though unnerved by his savagery, his companions think little of the woman's wailing. After all, of what importance are the words of a dying peasant? But soon, they begin to notice a change in Schweitzer. Already prone to violence and anger, his savagery begins to increase. Their robberies become more frequent. Robbery gives way to rape. Rape gives way to senseless murder. His companions, no doubt remembering the woman's final words before Schweitzer silenced her forever, soon part ways with the devolving murderer. At first, he seeks the companionship of other criminals, bandits and highwaymen that have never known anything but a life of violence. However, even those dregs soon shun him as his temper continues to escalate and his crimes become atrocities. Rumors begin to circulate as cattle and men are slaughtered night after night, tales of a wolf that walks as a man does, a creature with an insatiable taste for pain, misery, and blood. The area around Whitlick suffers a campaign of terror that continues after sundown each day, until, finally, Schweitzer comes across what would prove to be his last victim. Elizabeth Birla, a local beauty and farmer's daughter, is violently assaulted and raped, but manages to escape with her life. Finally, with a surviving witness, the townspeople know what they are facing, and parties are sent out. Days later, Schweitzer is discovered and a chase ensues, the vengeful villagers pursuing him until they reach Morbach. Cornered and exhausted, the madman is finally put down after a brief struggle. Buried at a crossroads nearby, a small shrine is erected. Remembering the almost supernatural fury of a man many of them believed to be an actual werewolf, a candle was lit at the shrine in the hopes of quieting the cursed soul interred there. And while that should have been the end of the story, it wasn't. Time passed. Elizabeth Bierla gave birth to Schweitzer's bastard son, Martin, and raised him to be a respected member of the community. The world went to war once, then again. Germany was split in two, and through it all, the candle remained lit. 
First, out of superstitious fear, then out of a sense of tradition. By the year 1988, Moorbach had changed a great deal, but still the shrine stood. Now located near a military base, soldiers would notice it in their comings and goings, but rarely wondered at its purpose. Then, one night, a group of men noticed that the candle, which had always been lit before, had been snuffed. An unremarkable occurrence to be sure, but unusual enough to spread a sense of unease to the men as they went about their patrol. A sense of unease that seemed entirely justified when, later that night, the base's perimeter alarm went off. Investigating, one soldier is shocked when he sees a tall creature, wolf-like but standing on its hind legs. It snarls at him, then leaps a three-meter high fence before disappearing into the woods. Calling to the others, a trained tracking dog is brought, but upon reaching the site, it simply lets out a mournful howl and refuses to proceed further. Since that night, the candle has remained lit, leaving those in the region to wonder if, or when, they will again hear from the Moorbach monster. While the beast inside may terrify some, there are other, more mundane fears. A phobia can be defined as an irrational terror, an unreasoning dread at even the most common of objects or situations. Anything from a crowd, to a tight space, to a type of food or sound can trigger a wave of panic and terror that drives all rational thought from the sufferer's mind. For the subject of our next story, from writer David Crabtree, a common garden intruder provokes just such a heightened response in one woman. And while she may be embarrassed by the way her pulse climbs as the chill ice of fear creeps up her spine, she's about to learn that she's right to be afraid. For what she's facing is no mere pest. Instead, she is facing the Mycelum Network. have a somewhat unusual personality quirk. I suffer from mycophobia, the fear of mushrooms. Everything about them creeps me out. How they look, how they smell, how they taste. I would rather saw my own arms off than sit down to a plate of mushrooms. It gets so bad that I can have full-on panic attacks just by looking at them. My boyfriend Carl thinks it's cute. Well, usually, anyway. He wasn't too impressed on our last date night. He'd saved up for months to take me out to the nicest restaurant in town. Instant relationship points right there. We were halfway through our meal when I ruined the night for both of us. One of the other customers, an older man in a smart business suit, was eating mushrooms. I tried not to look, but I couldn't help myself. It was like watching a car crash, something that disgusts and horrifies you, but you just can't take your eyes off it. Every bite he took made me feel as though I was eating them myself. Seeing those slimy black mushrooms slide into his mouth made my stomach perform acrobatics within me. My delicious, expensive meal came straight back up in the middle of the restaurant. I splattered everything, including Carl's favorite shirt. Never in my life have I been more embarrassed, and Carl took me home right away. He wasn't angry with me. He understood my phobia. No. It was so much worse than that. He was disappointed. That incident told me it was time to start looking into therapy. I was in my mid-twenties and completely sick of being afraid of mushrooms. My therapist told me that almost all phobias have a trigger event, some trauma in the past that led to a fear and anxiety in later life. Somebody with arachnophobia might have a childhood memory of a spider crawling across their face while they slept, for example. It wasn't hard for me to pinpoint the cause of my fear of mushrooms. I knew exactly where and when it happened, I just hadn't dealt with it. It started when I was 14. My granddad loved fried mushrooms. I don't mean he liked them every once in a while, I mean the man ate them with every meal. In the evening he'd put fried mushrooms in a pasta or stew, in the mornings he'd put them on toast. Half the time he just made himself a big plate full of nothing but fried mushrooms. 
when my grandmother passed away, I started going around to his house after school. He was the sweetest man I'd ever met, and I felt sorry for him. He was too proud to show it, but he was lonely without her. I was happy to spend an hour or so with him each day before I went home. I even had my own key so I could go whenever I wanted. About two months after my grandmother's death, I went round to his house as usual. He'd usually shout, Hello, Lisa, how was school? as soon as I'd walked through the door. On that day, though, he said nothing. Hi, it's Lisa, I called. Are you upstairs? There was no answer. Granddad? Nothing. I shrugged. He sometimes liked to sit in the garden when the weather was nice, and that particular day was a scorcher. I dropped my school bag and went into the living room. That's where I found him. He'd sat down on the couch, ready to enjoy a plate of fried mushrooms and just stopped breathing. My therapist explained that people have an automatic but very flawed capability for pattern recognition. I'd found my granddad's body and seen the plate of mushrooms in his lap. My brain had made a connection between the mushrooms and the trauma of my granddad's death. Basically, my subconscious told me that mushrooms equal death. There are quite a few ways to treat a phobia. I couldn't face the idea of flooding therapy. That would involve surrounding me with mushrooms, making me touch them, making me eat them until they no longer bothered me. No thanks. Maybe that sounds silly to you, but just picture yourself covered in the thing that creeps you out the most. Spiders, rats, centipedes, whatever it is that makes your skin crawl. That's flooding therapy. Since there was no way in hell I was going to do that, my therapist suggested something more gradual. My homework after the session was to go online and read up on mushrooms. The thought made me shudder, but it was better than the alternative. By researching mushrooms, I might be able to view them with a more academic mindset. It didn't help. I did learn what I imagined my therapist was hoping I'd discover. There aren't many dangerous mushrooms in England. Any child growing up in a rural area will probably have been scared shitless by Tales of the Death Cap, that deadly fungus that kills anybody who eats it. Well, that's actually not true. Almost nobody dies from death cap poisoning anymore. We are far more scared of them than we really need to be. Maybe the research could have helped. I get what my therapist was going for. Remove the fear by destroying my subconscious connection between mushrooms and death. Mushroom deaths are extremely rare in England, so what is there to worry about? That's when I learned about the mycelium network. Holy fuck. The mycelium network made mushrooms so much creepier than I'd thought possible. Did you know that mushrooms can communicate with each other? I'm serious, they have a system of roots that can spread for miles. If one mushroom is damaged, the others that share its mycelium network can tell. I actually cried when I read about it. My therapist had inadvertently given my phobia a whole new dimension. That night, I had nightmares about being trapped in the pale, spongy webbing of a forest of talking mushrooms. Carl had to wake me up to stop me from punching him as I tried to break free. So, therapy hadn't exactly helped, so I stopped going. I still kept an emergency phone number, though, for in case I had a panic attack. Having somebody to talk to usually helped me calm down again when I accidentally came into contact with mushrooms. It might be that I'd seen some in a garden or caught sight of them in a supermarket. Whenever I felt the anxiety reach a boiling point, I had a number to call. For a long time, I actually managed to get on with life just fine. I was having fewer panic attacks and the ones I did have weren't as severe. Me and Carl still couldn't face going into a restaurant again, but I was working on it and he was supportive. Things were starting to look up. Of course, things went to shit in the end. Carl sets off to work earlier than me, so I was alone when I stepped out the front door. I froze. My panic started to bubble up inside me and I could already feel the tears welling up in my eyes. There, in the middle of my lawn, was the most disgusting mushroom I'd ever seen. It was huge, a foot-wide lump of gray and black flesh. Thick yellow fluid oozed out of the holes riddling its uneven mass. It reeked, too. The damp stink of woodland rot filled my nose even from where I stood. I had to use my emergency number. It's okay, the therapist said as I explained what I was looking at. It'd taken me a long time to get the words out between my sobs. This is actually a good thing. How is it a good thing? This is the worst fucking mushroom I've seen in my life. Exactly. This is as bad as it gets. If you can face this, you can overcome your phobia. 
I didn't say anything for a while. What the therapist said made sense, but in that moment, I didn't want to face my fear. Again, maybe it sounds silly to some of you. Try to picture the mushroom as a giant spider or something and you might see why I was so upset. I don't think I can touch it, I said at last. You don't have to. Get a spade, the biggest one you have, and just squash it flat. Squash it so that you know it has no power over you. Honestly, I didn't know how long it took me to build up the courage to do it. It made me 15 minutes late to work, but I always set off far earlier than I need to. Somehow, I managed it. I pounded that disgusting gray and black mass into nothing more than a puddle of yellow ooze. My boss gave me an earful for being late, but I didn't care. I'd done it. I'd walked over to the world's most hideous mushroom and I'd demolished it. My grin didn't leave my face for the entire day. I was still grinning as I drove back home after work. When I got back, the pile of goo on the lawn had mostly cleared up. Carl starts and finishes work earlier than I do, so I figured he must have done it. As it turned out, I was right. He greeted me at the door with a huge smile on his face and kissed me the moment I got in. I'm so proud of you, Lisa. Sorry I left you to find that thing this morning. I was running a little late and I figured it might give you a chance to face your fears. Oh, so you're my therapist now, I said in a fake, angry voice. I couldn't keep it up for long. Well, at least you cleaned it up. Thank you for that. I thought it was the least I could do. This is a big deal. Remember what you manage to do whenever you feel your anxiety starting to play up. Don't forget how strong you are. You really are starting to sound like a therapist. Have you been on Wikipedia or something? Once or twice. He gave me a wink, then another kiss. We went upstairs, shedding our clothes with every step. The next morning, I woke up happier than I'd been in a long time. Carl was already gone, of course, but he'd left some jam toast on the kitchen counter for me. He'd also left something else, a note on the front door. Use the back. I frowned. We never used the back door. It led down a grimy path between rows of houses that was always full of litter. We always went out the front where we had a decidedly more pleasant view of a street filled with neatly mowed lawns. When I opened the front door, I understood the note. The mushroom was back, grown to its full size overnight. It had brought dozens of its friends to each one just as big and twice as ugly. I genuinely screamed at the sight of my infested lawn. My phobia came back with the force of a falling dump truck. Carl had obviously started trying to uproot one of them before going to work. There was a trowel left beside one of the huge oozing mushrooms and a hole at its base. The mycelia, the mushroom's roots, went deep into the earth. A hideous spider's web of pale fungal flesh that could have well gone on for miles. Uprooting them wasn't a job for one man in a hurry to get to work. I called my panic number again and my therapist did his best to calm me down. It was no use. I'd thought that destroying the mushroom would show me I was in control. All it did was reaffirm to me how quickly and how insidiously the damn things could spread. Work wasn't an option that day. I couldn't bring myself to leave the house. The thought of microscopic fungal spores drifting through the air terrified me. I called in sick, locked all the windows, and shut the curtains. I didn't even want to look outside. When Carl came home later that day, he looked worried. Not about the mushrooms. No, Carl had never shared my phobia. He was worried about me. I'm sorry, Lisa. I tried to dig them up, but they were rooted too deep. I didn't have the time. Don't go near them, I sobbed. Just, I don't know. Call an exterminator or something. I'm not sure there's any such thing as a mushroom exterminator. I'll do it myself. No! Please, just stay inside. Have a look online for gardener later. There has to be a spray or weed killer or something they use. Don't do it by hand. All right, I'll have a look tonight. For now, just try to relax as best as you can, okay? We didn't have sex that night, but that was fine. Carl looked up a specialist who dealt with fungal infestations. He tried calling, but the number was out of service. He promised to look again in the morning and spent the night with his arms wrapped around me. The next day, I woke up screaming. Carl jumped awake next to me, mumbling some half-asleep nonsense. When he saw what made me scream, his eyes widened in fear. Holy shit. 
Our sheets were covered in gray and black patches of oozing mushroom flesh. I kicked them off in a violent panic and backed up against the wall. I felt something soft and wet burst as my bare skin pressed against it. I didn't have to look around to know that they were growing on the walls, too. Lisa, I want you to go to a friend's house for a while. I didn't say anything. I just nodded. My bags were packed and I was in my car within the hour. I'd sorted out my things in a sort of terrified dream state. The mushrooms were all over the house and I'd gone well beyond a simple panic attack. I was in the kind of shell shock you might find in soldiers. Promise me that you won't try to deal with this yourself, I said to Carl before I started driving. Look, I agree they're disgusting, but they're still only mushrooms. They can't actually hurt anybody. Promise me! Carl looked put out. He always did have that stupid macho man philosophy when it came to looking after the house. You only call somebody if you're too stupid or too weak to do it yourself. I started to suspect that perhaps a specialist he'd phoned hadn't been disconnected at all. Carl probably just told me it had. I promise, he said at last. That was good enough. He was headstrong, but he'd never once broken a promise to me in his life. Carl's word was golden. I'd agreed that I'd spend three days at my friend Julia's house. She was always happy to have me over and knew about my phobia. Waking up to find a house full of mushrooms was exactly the kind of thing that required a few days on her couch and more than a few bottles of wine. Stupidly, I'd forgotten to pack my phone charger and Julia didn't have one of her own. By the second day at her house, the battery on my crappy brick of a phone was completely gone. Thanks to the wine, I only noticed when the end of the third day rolled around. I was supposed to phone Carl when I was setting off. Since my phone was dead and I couldn't even remember my own number off the top of my head, that wasn't going to happen. Still, I didn't think it would really matter. The drive home was nerve-wracking. The wine was long since out of my system and with its absence came the usual low mood. Anybody who's had an anxiety problem can tell you that a low mood can sometimes bring on an attack. I didn't actually get to that point, but I was close. Images of the lumpy gray and black mushrooms kept forcing their way into my mind. I did my best to block them out, but was only half successful. My fear came back in full force when I arrived back at my house. The lawn was infested. Dozens of mushrooms, some of them as high as two feet, covered every available patch of earth. My heart beat out a sped-up techno tune as I made my way to the front door. I was in that dreamlike state again as I pushed it open. I felt the squelch as the door broke through mushroom flesh. The stink of it should have been overpowering, but I hardly noticed. There's a sensation that goes beyond terror. It leaves you cold and numb. Nothing feels quite real. Yellow pus seeped into my shoes as I stepped into the house. The carpet was completely hidden beneath gray and black mounds. I started to walk across the hall, not truly feeling as though I was in control of my body. Carl? My voice sounded faint. I could barely manage a whisper. Carl? Are you upstairs? There was no answer. I dropped my bags to the floor. There was a wet thud as they broke through the mushroom skin covering the floor. Carl? Nothing. I couldn't face going upstairs. The way was blocked by huge tumors of fungus. I didn't think I could bring myself to squeeze my way through them. Instead, I took a right and went into the living room. <sighs> no, I whimpered. This isn't happening. This isn't happening. This isn't happening. I repeated the mantra to myself. My mind was lost to a numbing fog. I couldn't help but try to convince myself that what I saw wasn't real. I only recognized Carl's body because he was wearing his favorite shirt. A shirt stained yellow and torn, split open from within by the oozing mounds of gray and black flesh. Life, in all its forms, reaches out for other life. And indeed, it's time for us to reach out to you, dear listeners. 
The signal is always seeking to expand to new places, new territories. But in order for us to find the most fertile ground for the seeds we wish to sow, there must be a way of sorting the wheat from the chaff. That is why, in order to determine the location of our next local broadcast, we have developed a means of finding those who truly wish to join us. So, prepare yourself, dear listeners, and pay careful attention to the rules, because it's time for The Test Pattern. Hello, and welcome to the test pattern. Decipher the code and return your answers to thisisthesignal at gmail.com. The first subject to do so will become the focal point of our next broadcast. Today's cipher is 5, 7, 1, 19, 19, 5, 13. Again, please submit all answers to this is the signal at gmail.com. And as some of you seek to join the signal, the time has come for us to conclude our broadcast. For our regular listeners, don't despair. We'll be back with an intermission soon. For those who are just now discovering us, We'll see you again very soon on The Signal. Well? That is insane. (laughs) Tell me about it. I mean, if what you're telling me is true, and part of me wonders if it is, someone's figured out how to manipulate the building blocks of the universe, play with creation itself, and they're using it to broadcast a... Radio drama? That's what I thought too, but then again, the first ever sound recording was Edison reciting Mary Had a Little Lamb. Maybe, but but that was just a test. He didn't compose an entire program with actors and sound effects and contests and... Look, if this was a test, it wouldn't be this complex. It's like this show is the actual purpose behind the invention. It's like someone... Inventing nuclear power just so they can cook Pop-Tarts. Yeah, but on the plus side, you'd have some pretty well-done Pop-Tarts. I'm serious, Miles. Someone just... playing with the fabric of the universe like that is beyond terrifying. And was it just me, or did that all seem... oddly... targeted? What do you mean? You say you've heard these broadcasts before. How many? Two... Have they ever gone out of their way to welcome new listeners before? Well, no. And those introductions to the, to the stories and, and segments, warning people against pursuing the unexplained? I don't know about you, but it all felt oddly personal. I mean, it is a horror show, but that was rather odd. Did you try to contact the people who made it? Th- they mentioned how to get in touch. I tried after the last two. None of the email addresses exist, and I couldn't find any of the authors or web pages anywhere. Miles, if this is what you think it is, then it's possible that this signal isn't actually from here. Like it said in the intro. Other places. Other times. If that's the case, then the implications... So, convinced? I'll need to see your data. All of it. Already done. Everything looks good. I'll have to check them when I get home. It's getting late. What? Ugh, damn it. I can't believe the time. Alex is gonna be pissed. Come on. Who's Alex? My son. Oh. I didn't notice a wedding ring. No. You didn't. Uh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to bring up something that... It's fine. So, starting to think that we might be onto something? Maybe. There's one thing that disturbs me, though. Just one? If that's all, then you're in better shape than me. I'm serious. If this signal really is able to send messages, sounds, whatever, to anywhere in the universe, any universe, 
Who's to say the opposite isn't true? What do you mean? I mean that if they're able to send a sound wherever they want, why not record it in the same way? In theory, who's to say that they can't record from where or whenever they want? That's actually pretty disturbing now that I consider it. (laughs) Are you ever serious? Not if I can help it. Anyway, just head straight down the corridor and it'll take you to the visitor's garage. No breadcrumbs required. Great. Are you sure it's all right for me to take this with me? What the boss doesn't know can't hurt us, right? Right. I'll be in touch. Huh. Anyone listening in? (laughs) Bullshit. Hey there, me again, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. I hope you liked the show, and if you did, you can catch more great stories at our subreddit, Signal Horror Fiction, where you can add your own works, which might just be featured here. If you'd like to support the show even more directly, including pay for our great performers, you can contribute at our Patreon, where you'll be able to get great bonuses that can make a great experience with our show even better. Speaking of our performers and contributors, today's voices were Krista Elliott as Amy, and myself as Dr. Miles Teagan, Ashley Webb Rice and myself reading our first story, Marie Mitchell reading our second, and musical contributions from both myself and Kevin McLeod, whose work can be found in Incompetech.com. That's spelled I-N-C-O-M-P-E-T-E-C-H. I'd also like to provide acknowledgement to AR Sound Effects for providing some of the noises that help to bring this show to life. Also, if you'd like to read more great stories from the author of I've Been Getting Strange Letters from the St. Louis Prison, please follow him on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash Andrew Harmon Writes. Also, keep in mind that all stories and sound effects used here are copyrighted their respective owners and are being reused under a Creative Commons license with permissions from their respective owners. I hope you enjoyed our first full episode and hope that you'll check back with us in the future. Be sure to follow us, like us, and recommend us to whoever might be interested. After all, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs>